چل تو چل The rare springs of the desert, visible sources of water, the essential of life, are sacred in the ancient customs of the Navajo, and rain chants are rendered at these springs with offerings of semi-precious stones and flower pollen. Such ceremonies challenge the power of the medicine man. In the modern history of the Navajo Nation, time is often reckoned in reference to the Big Walk. In 1862, their patience exhausted by the failure of treaties and agreements, federal authorities called for subjugation of these Indians whose warlike habits had made them a source of danger to their neighbors, both red and white. The man assigned to this task was Colonel Christopher Carson, Adelohi, the rope thrower to the Indians, Kit Carson to every American, and by all his names, generally regarded as the greatest Indian fighter of his time. Relentless pursuit forced the last band of Navajos into the difficult mazes of the Canyon de Chez in the high plateaus of Arizona, now a barren place, but then flowering with peach trees. Volunteer troops, aided by Carson's trained Ute Indians, engaged in the last drive. It was winter. Snow, which made phantoms of the trails, and temperatures far below zero, marked the campaign as one never to be forgotten. Their backs to the walls they loved the Navajos surrendered. Today, Canyon de Chez, with its beauty and historical background, is one of America's interesting national monuments, and the Navajos live there still. Navajo captives were taken first to Fort Wingate, New Mexico, then 300 miles farther east to Fort Sumner, and all save the sick and aged walked. It was the big walk to Hualte. There are still on the reservation proud old Navajos who made the journey. They recite how 12,000 of their people were held at Fort Sumner for three years, how they tried farming there, how their crops failed, and they thought the land a curse. Now, finally, a delegation of their chiefs were permitted to make the long journey to Washington, where, under the vaulted dome of the Capitol, President Grant dealt with them patiently as their great white father and relenting, agreed that they might sign new treaties and return to the lands of their former occupation. General Sherman negotiated the new treaty at Fort Sumner. The Navajos refused the government's offer of general farm stock and implements. All they wanted, said they, was one old buck goat to tie by his horns to a tree, to symbolize to their people that all which can happen to him who fights the United States government is to butt out his brains. Sheep and goats seeking life on high, dry, rugged land represent the problem of the Navajo. Typical flocks are a strange mixture of scrawny black and white sheep and comical goats tended by quiet little boys to whom the English language is unknown. On the reservation, water is precious and the flocks scramble miles to drink at shallow springs. In winter, the altitudes of the reservation cover the springs with ice and the sheep and goats break it with tiny rock-sharpened hoofs. No Indian is more colorful than the Navajo. His history is packed with evidences of a keen sense of humor, self-esteem, an utter lack of fear, and a tendency to play and to travel rather than to settle down. One pure type is called the long hair. Some still wear the ancient costumes from boots to headdress. The youngsters reveal the care they are being taught to take of their health in the schools and hospitals. This boy is an educated interpreter. The most widely known product of the Navajo is the rug. Though not identical, they bear similar designs, and genuine ones are of homegrown, homespun wool, dyed with native concoctions of earth, 
stones, berries, and roots. It's a Navajo trick to make buttons of silver coins. In good times, his clothes glisten. In bad times, the buttons are spent for food. The original treaty reservation was three and a half million acres. Today, it is 15 million acres, by far the largest in the nation, lying on the high, windy country of northeastern Arizona, northwestern New Mexico, and the southern tips of Utah and Colorado. It is near the southern transcontinental route, 600 miles from Denver, 100 miles from Albuquerque, and 550 miles from El Paso. Its topography is mountainous desert, and its altitudes vary from 4 to 10,000 feet. The only timber of consequence is in the mountains, where the Navajo, number one American vacationist, goes to spend the summer. In winter, he goes back down the mountain with his sheep and his family to the bracing sun of the desert. The windy desert seems endless, and the Navajo wanders about it with his flocks, abandoning Hogan's wherever he pleases. Weather is severely hot, cold, dry, wet, or windy, whatever the season or the mood. reservation's meanest marauder is erosion. The eternal winds and the sudden onslaughts of water from rain and melting snow have knifed canyons into the mazes and laid the valleys bare. Small gullies drain soil from around vegetation, and trees which have withstood the rain fall victims to root exposure. On the rugged reservation, burros and ponies are better for travel than cars, which have to scrape over and straddle the sage, slosh along like these in picturesque canyon de chez, or wallow through rolling ruts and dry washes. The typical Navajo travels by wagon in family groups with children and dogs. Though opposed to highways which might bring droves of curious tourists, Indian authorities do favor a system of all-weather dirt roads to remove the hazards of desert transportation. This one is a Civilian Conservation Corps project which goes up one side of Gray Mountain and down the other to make the mountain summer homes and pastures more accessible. Hillsides are blown away to loosen rocks and earth for the big iron snoots of the bulldozers. Life in Canyon de Chez represents the Navajo's refusal to leave the lands of his ancestors. The great canyon walls, with their ancient markings, hang over spots never touched by the elements and shower the warm sunshine down on women and children amid piles of drying corn. A wanderer with his flocks, the Navajo is a determined settler when he farms, and rehabilitation of the land he refuses to leave is important. In the northwestern corner of New Mexico is the agricultural community of Shiprock, finest farming center on the reservation. At harvest time, the corn shelling mill is a whirl of activity, and sound evidence of the economic status the industrious Navajo can attain if he'll apply himself to his land. Sacks are filled as each man catches his product, and volume demands the use of shovels. On the fringe, groveling in the shelled ears, a blind gleaner is tolerantly accepted by the throng. Heavy-wooled sheep grow fat in the trading post corrals against a background of the mass of desert rock which gives the community its name. In the same corral is a billy goat whose arrogant prosperity is in contrast to his tree-nibbling brethren who scramble in the desert. Shiprock's agricultural excellence springs from the scientific production of seedlings and plants grown in the community nursery and divided among the Indian farmers for sowing on their irrigated acres. Young men are trained in the care of the nursery's delicate products, and their knowledge is passed on to the farm families, 
for whom the plants and seeds are provided. Seeds are ground out of their husks by these same young men with special implements and repeated applications of Navajo elbow grease. Shiprock's dairy herd of blooded Holsteins supplies the community's milk demand. The herd is housed in good barns, led beside the still waters and fed in green pastures. Occasionally, individual families attain the group excellence of Shiprock. This one affords a food cellar with important pumpkins and contemporary products. As it was to his blunder-busted adversary, the pilgrim on his first Thanksgiving, so to the Indian is the big round pumpkin a symbol of plenty. And fat youngsters in speckled maize laughing or crying are evidence of the productivity of the land and the people. Kayenta, 160 miles in the high desert, farthest post office from a railroad in the country, yet a place of comfort and convenience. Though most distant, it is typical of the reservation's several educational and medical centers. Little Navajo boys go there to school and conduct themselves much in the manner of little boys the world around. Warm noon meals break the school day and feel good to young stomachs. And on days when the sun's just right, they have it in outdoor style and like it. If grand old Navajos look down from happy hunting grounds, how sad a sight it must be to see time so quiet and dull that Navajos have to fight each other. In the distant desert beyond the calls of family doctors, hospitals like this at Kayanta are of vital importance. Babies brought in from dirt-floored Hogan's and the frantic clasps of superstitious mothers may be kept around for months until strong and happy. Others just come to the hospital to live while mama pulls through with another. Adults like this one are coaxed in from their desert homes for treatment. To make the Navajo more comfortable in his own home and a healthier, happier individual is inherent in the improvement program. So domestic science has its place in the community schools, such as this one at Chin Lee. Native abilities to make use of the products of their menfolk are afforded further development. Modern conveniences lend aid in the doing of woman's inherited jobs and the preparation of age-old tribal dishes. Dark brown, black-haired youngsters sit in customary rows with white man's books or brush up on tea time etiquette at tables cut to size. Use of the English language is encouraged and children learn new names. Ancient tendencies get free reign in the modeling and carpentry classes. And the glory of such modern braves as Jim Thorpe pound in the hearts of these older boys as they dream of being great athletes. This game with the usual sideline trimmings is between two schools at Tuba City, Arizona on a Saturday afternoon late in November. After it's over, the students will have supper in the mess hall, then lounge in the dormitories, and in the surrounding homes, there may be venison fresh from Kaibab Forest. This sort of Navajo home is rare among the circular mud and log Hogan's and its existence and maintenance are the work of this unusual woman whose progressiveness also finds expression in the scholastic attainments of her studious son. A weird contemporary of such advancement is the still prevalent superstition among the Navajos which keeps them in mortal fear of touching or even being in the presence of a dead person and the startling urge which sometimes drives them to return to a Hogan where a body lies, to burn it and fly away across the sage. Relief in the form of
of things to put in his stomach and on his back are necessary to certain Navajos, just as they are to some people of all races. This old brave, blind with trachoma, wraps his bundle with a native trick and stumbles away. These two, man and wife, also blind, have theirs brought as they sit in the dark in the sunshine. As food is placed before him, the old man takes inventory by touch. Looking off into black space, the old woman is the perfect example of the ravages of the dread trachoma, disease of the desert. It has been a Navajo affliction for generations, and doctors believe it is caused by the incessant winds, flying sands, and glaring sun. A unit in every hospital is devoted to trachoma treatment. Not far east of prosperous Shiprock, there is being developed a similar project called Fruitland. A squadron of dirt movers operated by Navajos level off the desert after it's cleared of rocks and sage. Reclamation of desert for farming is necessary. The average Navajo family is five persons, and with a 50,000 population, there are 10,000 families. If the present farmland was equally divided, each family would have about one acre of irrigated land, two and a half acres of floodwater land, and one half acre of dry land. Under the land reclamation program, these property figures can be nearly doubled. Desert land, like this Fruitland Valley, is very productive when irrigated. Upstream from the reclaimed land, dams, floodgates, and canals are built from materials quarried on location. Precious water held in check is run along concrete canals and let off into irrigation ditches and out onto the thirsty, dusty land. The reservation's range resources are as limited as its agricultural possibilities, so all potential grazing land is in the reclamation program. Water for sheep and cattle is provided in great modern tanks with windmill power. in ponds created by the CCC, or in native water holes held by dams of thatched wood and mud and stones. Water, the savior, becomes the killer as it roars down the desert dry washes after cloud bursts, and substantial dam structures are slashed open and the water spreads out and disappears into parched crevices. Their water gone, cattle and sheep wander aimlessly, then become more white bones in the sun. In lands at the northerly edge of the reservation in New Mexico, there's a problem as serious as it is unique. Private sheep herders bring their flocks across the line to preempt scant Navajo water and consume Navajo grass. Sheep, sheep, sheep. With a range capacity of 560,000 sheep units, the reservation labors under its actual load of a million. At Ganado and elsewhere, the building of better pasture through irrigation and grazing control is proving the can-be profit to the Navajo from the fewer sheep he must have if his lands are not to be devastated. There can be sheep like these, heavy in high-grade wool and mutton, in contrast to the mongrels of the desert. A concrete example of the way the Navajo Rehabilitation Plan works is found at the Indian School at Fort Wingate, New Mexico. The modern Navajo is turning to other pursuits, but inherently he's a shepherd, and for generations his fortunes have been wedded to sheep and their products. There are many Navajos and many sheep, and the solution is fewer, better sheep, and protection and improvement of the desert range. 
Convincing the Navajo he can profit as well from these fewer, better sheep on better range is the object of such wool laboratories as this one at Fort Wingate. Differences in wool qualities are quickly reflected in the prices which growers are paid for it, and specialists at Wingate are continually making tests and following scientific trails which will lead the Navajo to greener pastures and thicker wool. These are some of the guinea pigs being used in the experiments. Sheep carefully selected and transported good distances to be crossbred with typical Navajo stock to get better wool, hides, lamb chops, and mutton. Also important in the experimental program is this flock of a thousand sheep owned by the laboratory and handled on the Wingate Reservation as they should be if properly tended by a Navajo shepherd. Mounted pelts of bobcats and coyotes, time-honored sheep marauders, are decorative exhibits in another department at Wingate. The Navajo tans the hides of the sheep and goats that he kills and sells them to boost the family income. His primitive tanning methods have not been as effective as they might have been. In a classroom workshop, an improved procedure is taught. Of significance is the fact that in this course in tanning, Care has been taken to avoid revolutionary ideas. The old Navajo method and implements are used wherever they will fit. The student easily acquires the new method and takes it from the classroom workshop back to his hogan. The tanning and leather shop has other uses. In it are mended the shoes of the pupils of the school. Harness for the teams used in the school's field work also is repaired and sometimes made. Indian boys who finish this course may go out into the world of affairs to work in the shops of the white man. The story back of this department at Wingate has its humorous twist. Recently there has been a tendency on the part of young Navajo rug makers to use drugstore dyes and imitation wool as shortcuts to prosperity. This fact has been exposed by the Navajos themselves, and at places like this Wingate School, the younger generation is being told that such practice is sacrilege and that only the real thing must be made. In this laboratory, an Indian woman employs formulas for the production of original colors used in weaving generations ago. And again, the Navajos are gathering vegetable and mineral products from the desert at the doors of their hogans and using them in the rugs and blankets to which they have given their name. Efforts being made to influence diversification in the Navajo's pursuit of a livelihood are equally practical. Agriculturists at Wingate are demonstrating the essentials of farming in their specific relation to the Navajo country. On the school property are projects involving planning and construction intended to show what any cooperating group of individuals of the tribe could accomplish in transforming their lands for agricultural purposes. Construction of reservoirs to catch runoff water from the mesas and the building of simple dams to check the rush of surface water from higher altitudes is demonstrated in actual work by the students. On acres made fruitful by these demonstrations is produced much of the school's food supply. A tribal characteristic of the Navajo is his devotion to his type of dwelling, 
the circular, dirt-floored Hogan. It has been his home since the beginning of his history, and he shows no inclination to change. To meet this persistence halfway, the reservation's better housing program, centered at Fort Wingate, is offering models with modern conveniences, but with the same old roundhouse walls. The Navajo family sits and sleeps on the ground and is no friend of furniture, but such exhibits as these are creating curiosity which may bring social change. Carpentry shop students at Wingate apply themselves to the better housing problem and to such other practical things as transportation on wheels. Girl students at Wingate, like those in other schools, in training themselves for the future, are constantly aware of the needs of their people. From this classroom, there's a flow of simple toys to Navajo children in the remotest stretches of the reservation. Here's a cradle made from a flower barrel, and more importantly,